Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Um, our speaker today is Arvind Gupta from Mayfield, also known as Mayfield Fund, also known as uh, Mayfield Ventures. That's a 54 year old kind of uh, old established Silicon, uh, sorry, Sand Hill Road venture capital company. But um, and he is going to talk about what he's doing uh, at Mayfield now. But I think the uh, story that got him here, which he'll do better than me, started for me and Tom Harmio, who's up front here in uh, chemical en uh, engineering and energy systems and engineering, uh, where we share joint appointments, uh, said, I got an interesting guy I want you to meet. I said, Jesus Christ, he knows, you know, Bill Gates and, and uh, you know, all kinds of uh, scientists, uh, businessmen and celebrities. Who could be more interesting than that? So I wandered in, I think it was a Friday afternoon and uh, met Arvind and actually went through an early version of this talk, which allegedly is a lot better now. So Arvind's deal uh, is he was a bioengineer by training. And then uh, I think this is probably significant, worked in Shanghai for IDO on ideation and creativity. Uh, for a bit, and then I don't know, the actual transition back uh, got really interested in seeding uh, VC funds with biotech people uh, to ensure uh, planetary health. And at that point, it was really based on uh, food alternatives to animal uh, products. And that it led to the for his form formulation with his partner here, Poe Brunson, who's here with us. I guess he was one of the founders or early hires of IndieBio, which over a five-year period funded, see if I can get the number right, 126 startups. Some of them are well-known companies now. And I think along the way, um, in, in looking at the pitches for the company, or hearing the pitches for the company, said, geez, this is good for revolutionizing food, which does have a direct link to energy, but also is probably expandable into this frame that he calls planetary health, which means food, health, and climate change are all intimately related in a way that he'll uh, describe. He's won many awards and given many prestigious um, addresses and uh, has produced this book, a book called Breaking the Code, which I highly recommend, uh, by the way, uh, which I'll talk about now. And he and Poe are, are actually going to produce a trilogy out of that uh, books by the same name. You'll have to have colons or something for the sequels, a little bit like Lord of the Rings. So with, I talk too much. Without further ado, the one and only Arvind Gupta. Arvind. Thank you so much. Uh, there we go. It is now on. Well, thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. And it's been lovely getting to know you and Tom here at Stanford and getting to know the Stanford community in general. Um, so yeah, I want to talk to you today about reversing climate change through uh, capitalism. And those are two, two words that don't often go together, I think. Uh, in, in fact, the only time they do go together is when you take out the reversing part, right? Um, and so the way we do it uh, and is the subject of, of the talk. And the way you can actually do this consistently and repeatably over time is the goal of this talk. So first, you know, uh, John mentioned a few things about me. But yeah, uh, I invest in companies. I'm an investor. Um, now at Mayfield as a general partner, prior to that the, as the founder of IndieBio. Uh, I invest in companies trying to reverse climate change, like I said, uh, using capitalism as its engine. Prior to that, I was a designer, and I think that uniquely taught me to look at problems versus solutions. Um, as a design director, I always said the best problems lead to the best products. So really take the time to find worthy problems. And as I was making my transition from being a designer uh, to being a venture capitalist, I thought, OK, well, what are the problems that are going to generate the best products in the world? And climate change really is the thing that emerged from that question. Uh, where else are you going to find consistent, over, durable problems over time? So 
with that, um, did also write a book with Poe Bronson uh, talking about the early st stages of that journey um, called Decoding the World. Uh, and like uh, John said, two more to go. So that's me in a nutshell. And I just wanted to share that with you a little bit. Um, so the question is, first, why, why is this important? I know it's a patently obvious question to many. Uh, why, why is planetary health even worth talking about? Um, and here you can see the, an animation of the temperature rise every year um, from late 1800s. Here you can see World War II is happening and really oil has become the, the battery of choice for the world. And what that is starting to do for climate change. Uh, you can see inexorable warming of the global average temperatures. Now, it's really important uh, to see, one, that this is a trend that's happening over time, but what's its effects? And it's projected that more people will die from climate change in the next 50 years than disease, all diseases combined. That's due to wars, translocations, things like that, of that nature. Um, and so even if you don't believe this, let's say you're a climate denier, right? Uh, you know, this is just an anomaly. It's going to go right back down. Sure. But if we can't figure out how to make capitalism sustainable over time, then we're going to have a real problem with keeping things more equal. And we're going to have a bigger disparity between the haves and have-nots. We can talk about that a little bit more later as well. So in any way, shape, or form, helping to make capitalism sustainable is the problem of choice for me. So uh, I talk about enduring planetary health businesses. Why is endurance or longevity important? Because dead companies don't change the world. And so we need to build business models and build approaches in the marketplace that are sustainable for decades. Not just to get in and get out as investors. And so these are some of the you know, five-year charts of some recent planetary health focused companies. Granted, a lot of this was driven by the 2021 hype cycle, right? So it's a little unfair of a chart, but it helped me make a point, which is we have to build businesses that succeed against other businesses that are not trying to make things sustainable. And really, we have to, you know, we have to beat those companies um, at their own game, which, by the way, to give you the punchline, is totally possible. Um, and in doing so, we have to look, okay, what are some lessons from clean tech 1.0 that we can draw from, that we can say, oh, okay, let's not go there. Well, uh, by the way, I don't know how many people have heard of clean tech 1.0, but clean tech 1.0 was a 2008-ish, circa 2008 wave of companies that were uh, really looking to replace oil as an energy commodity. Uh, and that was driven by excitement around uh, biotech and, uh, and hydrogen and other alternative fuels. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all of these because in the interest of time, there's a lot to discuss in this, in this talk. And, uh, and I, I promise not to keep you here until tomorrow. Um, but in essence, the, biggest, the big takeaway is you can't invest in high technology to make low price commodities. Low price commodities will never give you the margin that you need to put back into the business. Okay, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And I am excited to say that today is different. Um, today is different than 2008. And it's because we have a completely different social environment. We also, have a, different, a completely different understanding of the problem that we're trying to solve. So clean tech was really driven by this idea that oil was going to go to $400 a barrel. Climate tech, the wave that we're in today, 
is driven by the idea that CO2 levels keep on rising. Those are fundamentally different problems. And so what's interesting is when fracking was invented or became popular and widespread, the price of oil in around 2008 cratered, dropped to under 50 bucks. And that just basically decimated the clean tech sector. Now, the people that were really sad about that were the investors. When CO2 levels drop, the ones that the companies that are still around are going to be the ones that drove that drop. And uh, the people that are going to rejoice are society in general. So I think like th these are fundamentally different movements. And that's what I want to really drive home, originating from fundamentally different places. Uh, but every, every tech wave has, a, has an amazing silver lining. You, you, the busts uh, have an amazing silver lining, which is it, clean tech 1.0 drove the cost of enabling technologies down dramatically, uh, especially solar cells and other uh, fundamental units of, of clean tech. So here's a great um, slide of... of different technologies and their associated costs over time. You can see they all dr fall dramatically. The, the uh, rate at which it drops is called uh, the learning rate, technical term. Um, you can see synthetic biology has had the most dramatic drop in, in sequencing costs, which is leading to all sorts of new data, allowing us to understand how to manipulate life uh, fundamentally in much greater fidelity. There's also, um, you can see photovoltaics uh, or solar, solar panels have dropped by more than 97% ethanol. Other. So there's a lot of hope uh, for me that this bedrock of, of technologies can go ahead and help us drive more innovation, which is going to be really important and uh, very helpful because human desires are fundamentally unlimited. Um, that is a truth we must accept uh, if economics is a field of study, which is the study of scarcity. If we didn't have unlimited desires, we wouldn't actually have any problems with scarcity. Um, and so John Keynes talks about the invisible hand of the economy. It's not invisible, man. It's the hand of the consumer. And so where the consumer goes is where capitalism goes. So to direct capitalism to be a better capitalism we must go through the consumer. And this is an issue because this unlimited demand is creating uh, five Earths of pressure on one Earth of supply. So there's a conundrum. That's happening in real time right now, um, which is going to get delivered on. Why? Because capitalism is short-term greedy, which is fine is fine. Capitalism works great for innovation. It works great for a lot of things. So capitalism as, uh, as a force is really uh, supported by quarterly earnings and the decision makers making short-term uh, decisions, which is changing, interestingly enough. Why? Let's go back to the hand of the, con uh, of, of, um, the consumer. They want innovation, but they don't want to pay for it. Enterprises have figured that out. And so there's a lot of goodwill, brand goodwill, being uh, put to work to generate real value by showing consumers that they are sustainable. So this really um, compl com <laughs> complex chart on, um, on the right-hand side basically says that 25% of uh, Fortune 500 companies have made climate goals. $38 trillion, 33 or $38 trillion of market cap have said, we are going to be net zero by some date in the future. Now those, go those uh, statements and those goals get translated into innovation through market forces. So this is the opening salvo. And again, I have hope that the voice of the consumer, the hand of the consumer, will guide us there. So I think better capitalism, which is 
the same thing, uh, will give people what they want without having to steal it from the future. And that actually creates a, susta a sustainable and scalable future for everybody. Again, even if you don't believe in climate change, what this does is it helps create more equality uh, throughout the world in terms of living standard. Um, and I'm a venture capitalist, so why do I care? <laughs> why do I care? Because you could make a lot of money by solving these problems. Uh, I already mentioned $38 trillion are being allocated. Uh, or not being allocated, but uh, of market cap are looking at solving these problems. The entire world GDP in 20 years will be $100 trillion. There's an opportunity. Right now, it's going to double by $100 Sorry, thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, it's going to double um, in, in another 20 years. So the takeaway here, right, is, look, all of these sectors have to become sustainable. And so innovation is going to drive all of those waves. And the demand is on the other side. So feeding the world, building the world, and powering the world. Those are the three major uh, activities through which all carbon flows through society. And those three major sectors are all becoming decarbonized in various ways. And I think one of the exciting things is it's getting decarbonized uh, through a huge variety of different ideas and uh, products and companies. Again, it's not this narrow, uh, narrow area of activity. It's a broad revolution and movement. So why is now, again, different, or how is this going to work? I've, I've just given you a, a bunch of paradoxes. Um, if I'm in the audience, I'm going, yeah, I don't understand how that's kind of possible, right? Um, and so I'm excited also as a venture capitalist because there is a lot of innovation happening in multiple areas of science that can be leveraged and harnessed to solve these paradoxes. So I'm not going to spend much time on these slides, but like, I just want to give you a flavor of the breadth of what's happening uh, in the world today. Um, in just biology, we have genome editing and CRISPR, right? That, that alone um, has spurred a huge amount of innovation. Uh, microbial solutions, so uh, methanotrophs, as a matter of fact, we'll talk about this later. Uh, methanotrophs eat methane gas. They've been, they've, they've evolved to uh, use methane as energy source. Uh, there's uh, carbon capture, um, you know, plants, trees, best carbon capture source we have. So making those even more optimal. Uh, redoing our agricultural systems to become more sustainable. These are all areas where biology has been, um, been innovating. And so, you know, I mentioned this is a company that uh, Mayfield's an investor in, actually, called Windfall Bio. And they're uh, using methanotrophs to take waste methane emissions from, from dairies, from oil fields, uh, and landfills, and using the methanotrophs to then create high-quality organic fertilizer. How? Well, these methanotrophs when they're consuming these, the methane, they take nitro nitrogen gas from the atmosphere, tear it apart, and fix that nitrogen into its own uh, into the amino acids that it's using uh, to grow. And in doing so, it becomes bioavailable. So that's a way of really starting to take some of the problems that we have and turning them into solutions. The Every Company um, is actually one of the first companies I ever invested in, um, formerly called Clara Foods, they are using synthetic biology to make egg whites without the chicken. So you could code egg whites, egg, egg white proteins, into yeast, and then have the yeast basically brew them. And then you could reconstitute those egg white proteins into a product and make them into things like macarons, meringues, 
uh, and others. Geltor is another company that's using synthetic biology to create animal-free collagens. And not just any animal-free collagens, human collagens for things like makeup. When was the last time you can get a human collagen for makeup? It's not possible. Upside Foods, many people have probably heard of cell-based meats, or cultured meat. Um, so Upside Foods makes uh, actual chicken without the chicken by growing the, mammal, the, the actual avian uh, cells in culture and then reconstituting that into uh, chicken breasts. They're, uh, they're now being served um, at Bar Kren or Atelier Kren. So that's just biology. Chemistry, huge advances as well. Um, for carbon capture and storage, this is, uh, there's a lot of applications uh, using MOFs, uh, using different types of uh, CO2 to fuels, electrochemistries. Um, there's also some of the advances in chemistry can really help us think about um, sequestering large amounts of carbon, like enhanced rock weathering and things like that. Uh, other, um, other approaches similar to that. Direct air capture, if we can get better sorbents, adsorbents, we can figure out how to actually remove some of the CO2 from the air, which is very hard to do uh, energetically. So more advancements in, this, in these areas will turn that into a focus area that might bear real fruit. Um, I could go on, um, but let's just take a look at some of the companies that are also starting to commercialize these technologies, like 12, using electrochemistry to take CO2 and turn that into plastics, uh, fuels, and other, other um, products. And uh, they have a collaboration with Mercedes-Benz now. Again, showing that there's real economic interest in this. There's real, and it's all being driven by enterprise. I think that's one of the big things that's changed uh, recently, is enterprises have really woken up uh, to how to address this. Climeworks is a company uh, that is doing direct air capture. This is in Iceland. Uh, I'm married to an Icelander, so I know this company well and have visited them uh, many times in the past uh, years. But they're, they're looking at and figuring out how to best uh, capture the, uh, the CO2 um, and do this in an area that is got free, well, very cheap energy geothermal. Lithos is a company um, that is using olivine and basalt uh, to do enhanced red rock weathering. So when olivine um, and water come together, it's able to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, and then it makes its way all the way to the ocean, where it goes down into the sea and gets stored uh, for thousands of years. This is the natural weathering process. That's the natural system that happens uh, in, uh, in climate today. It's just doing it way faster. Lingrove is a company that is making uh, wood without trees by using flax instead with a bioresin. That's a guitar. That, that top piece is not from a tree. It's, ma it's uh, made with a resin and flax. So uh, again, if we can leave our trees in the ground rather than cut them down, it's a lot better uh, for our future. Physics. So um, yeah, even physics uh, has a ton of advancements recently that are driving things forward. So uh, from quantum computing, actually, which is interesting because I, I meet with quantum computing companies every once in a while, and a lot of them talk as, for their first applications being uh, coming up with new materials for climate change, for mitigating climate change. Um, you know, it, there's incredible buzz about fusion and fission and uh, other, other areas. So speaking of which, Commonwealth Fusion Systems recently raised $2 billion with a B and is getting, from what we hear, closer and closer 
uh, to actually creating a sustained fusion reaction. Um, I was talking to an investor about this, and I, you know, it was an interesting conversation because I said, well, electrons are pretty cheap, right? Like it's, we're gonna put a lot of investment into fusion to make pretty cheap electrons. And their comment was, was really great. I said, well, demand for elect these electrons are gonna go way up, continue to go way up. And so we need sources of those electrons that aren't determined by the wind and by, the, by day and night. Um, and so this is a huge step forward uh, once this is able to happen. But it's no longer, um, it's no longer pure sci-fi. I think that's the biggest thing for me that's changed from even five years ago. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of buzz about uh, the superconductor on Twitter, like, what was it, like three or four months ago? I thought it was kind of funny, but, um, but it is a holy grail. Um, and the idea of a superconducting wire to losslessly transmit electricity over long distances would have an enormous impact on our ability to mitigate climate change just for moving energy around. Um, so there's a company called Unearthly Materials that's, that's working on that. Um, and then nuclear fission, fission reactors, good old fashioned fission reactors uh, coming back into finding new application areas. Here's Radiant, uh, which that is a rendering of something that like it goes in the back of a semi. So you can just car drive it around. Um, and so, you know, as the public starts to come to grips with the safety systems and as we believe that fission can become safer and the waste can be dealt with, it becomes a very viable alternative to creating electrons that aren't dependent on intermittent sources. And AI advancements. <laughs> it continues to go. The, the advancements in computation, especially in the past six months, as everyone here knows, with uh, large language models and AI is just, it's in truly an extraordinary pace of, of change and innovation. So um, this has direct impact in climate technologies because we can start doing things like create digital twins of agriculture, uh, digital twins of the national grid, and figure out how to optimize how things are going and reducing waste. We can start looking at our waste chains and our supply chains and optimize all of those. So uh, a Mayfield investment is Chemex, which is using AI to design batteries, better lithium ion batteries, because they could search the entire space of mixing electrolytes very quickly and optimize it for, abs for, for very specific uh, conditions. Another one's Amp Robotics. This is a company that's using vision to look through the trash. And as the trash gets, there's got robots, it sees, and you can create better and more pure waste streams that have higher value. And that value can get turned over. Avalo is an AI company that is using AI to look at genomes, plant genomes. And in doing so, look at creating rice that doesn't release methane uh, and more tolerant species for different, uh, for, for drought and other conditions. Framework 44 is a, is a company that's getting incubated that is using uh, LLMs to design better catalysts, MOFs in, in uh, particular, to actually find uh, do the search space uh, for converting CO2 and other uh, chemicals into other higher value chemicals at a lower cost. So the one thing you might notice through all of those is that all of these examples, all these companies, what's common? They're all deploying those technologies to mitigate climate change through products, through products that people use whether they're enterprise or consumer, but they're products, the physical thing that gets sold. And so there's three paths to market for any product. You could either be 
better, it could be cheaper, or it could be required by law. So for venture, as, as a venture capitalist, I live in bucket number one. Bucket number two, cheaper products have a place in the world. Uh, they tend to be lower margin, and so different different capital sources can fund, fund those um, as they scale up. They just require a lot more capital up front. And then required by law, that's, that's just a tough one to predict. So um, and incumbents usually win those, uh, which again, it's not, doesn't mean that's a bad, like we should, I think lit, law is important, right? There's, we should all be wearing seatbelts. <laughs> that that's a good law. Um, but as a VC, I think we live in bucket number one. And so, you know, the, I think this is really important. The best sustainability companies are really the best product companies. And I'm going to use Tesla as an example a lot, so please bear with me on that. Um, but I just can't think of a better example in history. Uh, and we'll go over why. Um, but just as a... As a, a a little anecdote to hit, uh, bring it home. Um, our Subaru Outback died. Um, and so me and the kids, I have two girls, six and eight, and uh, we needed a new car. So we we're going to get a minivan because we were renting a Toyota Sienna, um, you know, while we were like getting a new car. And it's like an apartment on wheels. I don't know if anyone's seen one of these things. It's like literally a box, a giant box on, on four wheels. Um, and it's super fun for them. And so, you know, Chris, uh, my wife and I were talking, oh, we should like, we should just go test drive a Tesla. You know, like we're trying to reverse climate change through our, through our investing, might as well do it through our actions as well. So we get in the car, we go to the Tesla dealership and test drive a Y. It's got seven seats. And, uh, you know, we leave the, I, I'm driving and I leave the, the Tesla lot and I make a right and stomp on the accelerator and we shoot down the road like a rocket and the girls in the back start screaming, Tesla, Tesla. And right there as a family, we made a product decision, not a sustainability decision. And I think like it was a really important lesson for me as a VC um, in that moment. And so I think like that's where you see it. And there's a, there's a lot of decisions that Tesla has made that make it the company that it is. Um, and so... If we're trying to figure out how to, to make capitalism sustainable, and we know that it's going through products, and we know that those products are created and deployed by companies, the question could naturally ask is, what are the common traits of great planetary health companies? Can, can we learn something that is common to them all and repeatable? Um, and so, you know, as a partner at Mayfield, I talked extensively with uh, the managing director, Naveen, who's had decades of experience uh, in the space. Um, I had my entire indie bio experience um, for the past 10 years. And so we also looked at public company comps. What, what do companies look like after 10 years in the public markets? What do they, where do they evolve to? How does it go? Because if we need to build companies that stand that test of time, what can we learn? So what follows is uh, really a summary of 10 traits that are common to the real outliers in the past years um, in planetary health. Um, so one, man, is just uncompromising founders. Uncompromising. Notice I don't say mission-driven, Notice I don't say unreasonable. It's a very specific word. And this is the thing that I, in my own experience, have seen over and over again. The, these, these really great founders are uncompromising. They have a bar, they have a really high bar for themselves, for the, for the problems that they're trying to solve. And they bring that to them, uh, to their work, uh, and they bring it to the teams around them. So. Um, they also go all the way because they're, they're not looking for a quick, a quick financial win. They're, not looking for, they're looking to solve a problem. So they, 
they tend to they also tend to make set really really good goals goals that are hard to understand from the outside um, but make complete sense to their own internal guidance system which turns out to be right in the long run and so these uncompromising founders tend to attract n of one teams what i call n of one teams that means the the a team i don't know how many kids from the 80s are around <laughs> um, i might be the only one but uh but yeah so there's a there was a tv show called the a team and it really is about the best team on the planet with the best expertise in the area of problem that the company is trying to solve and uncompromising founders can bring those types of people together and then set those goals that the A team could go and execute on and that becomes one of the best moats there is you might be able to copy an idea but how do you copy a team if, if one company has the best people in the world it's going to be tough to catch up this n of 1 team then always generates 10x products what's a 10x product it's a phrase um that captures the idea that a 10x product is a product that once i use it going back to the old way is something i could never do again it just becomes patently silly to go back to the old way uh, i I'll already like the iphone is a great example of that the whole world was using blackberries mechanical keyboards at the time and uh an uncompromising founder named Steve Jobs decided to just make it all glass. And within just a, a year or two, a few years, the entire world switched over to that modality. There's no way you can go back. That's what a 10x product is. After driving, you know, we have two Teslas now, I can't imagine driving a gas car. 10x products, the great thing about them is they generally cr create high gross margin potential. Why? Because they tend to be premium. People will pay anything. Everyone talked about the iPhone when it first came out. Oh, it's so expensive. No one's going to afford it. Well, guess what? You save up. People will save up and spend a disproportionate amount of their uh, income on that product. Uh, as the cost curve is coming down on Tesla, it, originally it was still a very premium product. It hit a trillion dollar market cap as a premium product. Now, a high gross margin is also relative to its TAM, total addressable market. So that's something that's important to talk about. Generally, when you have a very very large TAM, a trillion dollars, 500 billion dollars, you can have lower gross margins than say software. Uh that's the classic example, 80% gross margins in software generally. Um but if you could generate 10 uh 40 billion dollars of revenues uh a year that supports valuations that um that still makes sense for investors number 5 uh these products tend to be a daily habit for someone for someone um and why does that generate uh why is that a common trait of these companies because when it's a daily habit i it it lives rent free in my mind i talk about it with others and i don't have to spend as much on marketing to convince you of anything tesla spends zero on marketing um number 6 they all control their destiny so that means owning a path to your customer either through direct distribution or through the ability to communicate your brand values or your values or your value proposition to the customer. So this is Microworks in Indie Bio company uh that um has invented a way of creating leather uh from mushrooms. And so the product is called Rishi, they named it Rishi and it's a B2B product. Fashion houses buy this product, but they talk about it as rishi as a material it's not mushroom leather that's critically important for 
MICA works to capture the value that it has created. Here's one that's interesting to me, is they've all innovated in the assembly line. Um, here's a picture of the GigaPress. This is a giant press that can make uh, the Model Y in three parts, the shell. And that's critically important because it allows you to lower costs and get to uh, better gross margins, which allow you to spit more money back into the company. It's a, it's a flywheel of good. So all, all of these great planetary health companies figure out how to innovate on the production side as much as on the product side. Uh, they also tend to work with corporates and governments to their advantage. Solar City uh, was a solar panel um, installation and distribution company uh, that was started by Kimball Musk, and they were very good at this. Uh, it's, there's a lot of tailwinds right now in, in sustainability with the Inflation Reduction Act, and, uh, and companies are taking advantage of it today. So this is something that allows you to have to raise less money and get subsidized uh, um, for it. Um, then you have to have a durable moat. This is an important story that I'll talk about shortly. Um, but you can create a bunch of value and be unique and have a 10x product, but if you have no way to defend it, it's over within years, within a couple of years. Because everyone will see it, copy it, and um, you're left uh, scrambling to catch up. Oftentimes, what that means is spending more money. So with high tech, um, you could try to use IP, but I think execution is the ultimate moat. So if you can really just attract the very best people, it goes back to, if you can get a lot of these uh, traits, these common traits, you, it, it's a flywheel that enables you to keep ahead. Finally, this is <laughs> becoming more and more important in our current financial environment, capital efficiency. Planetary health companies tend to be capital intensive. And so any company that is loose with its finances tends to run into trouble. So great founders really are constantly thinking about the ROI of every dollar they spend. We're going to spend a dollar hiring someone or doing an activity. Does that generate $2 of value? Asking that question on every decision. Um, and they also find other sources of capital debt versus equity, things like that. So from those 10, we can come up with these simple um, 10 KPIs uh, that um, can help guide the way. And these change over time. What the right shape is uh, changes over time, which we'll get to in a, in a moment. But um, ambitious goals. Do you have ambitious goals with clear milestones? Um, do you have a unique 10x product? Unique is really important, right? It's really hard, like I said, to be 10x on everything. So what are you going to be uniquely great at? Tesla doesn't have better range than a, than a gas car, but that's okay. That's not the point. That's not the value proposition. Uh, a massive TAM. And the 10x product helps you understand that TAM. In other words, uh, if you are 10x better than a substitute, that substitute is your real TAM. You might be able to grow it over time as you get better at other things, but then you could be very precise. Um, high gross margin potential. Um, fast cash flows baked into the business model. So um, all businesses go through this loop. Cash, uh, inventory, accounts receivable, back to cash. The company that could do that the fastest generally wins. So if you can find ways of speeding that up, you'll be in a better financial position to weather storms. Be a daily touch point for your customer. Figure out how to become that. Uh, again, look at your operating efficiencies. Making sure there's a direct relationship between you and the, and the consumer. Um, that you have a moat and that you leverage the capital that's available for free. So let's do a quick 
uh, case study of uh, case study is probably the wrong. It's, it's not very detailed. <laughs> but so this isn't going into a 20 page discourse here. Uh, but a quick snapshot. Let's just take these KPIs and take a look at two companies and see what they did. Uh, one on the left is Tesla. The one on the right is Beyond Meat. Uh, they're both public companies, so they were you were able to get some data on them and take a look. So um, let's go ahead and <laughs> take a look at Tesla. Um, ambitious goals with clear milestones. Yep, Elon Musk always puts out very ambitious goals. Um, he says Cybertruck's going to be ready. He might miss some. <laughs> might, just maybe. Uh, but it drives the team. Um, do they have a unique 10x product? Yep. People love. And again, I say the quickness of Tesla. That's, there's something precise there, right? There's a lot of reasons to love those cars, but there was something precise in their entry point with the Roadster. It was, it was billed as faster. Um, massive cham. Yep. Cars are 1.5 trillion. High gross margin potential. Um, so this, this has actually dropped since the last quarterly announcement, but... Um, the 13% industry average, uh, the Tesla's higher than that. Um, and it's rewarded in the public markets with a massive enterprise value to revenue multiple. Um, does it have fast cash flows? Yeah, it's trying, it's innovating. It's okay. It's not, it's not super fast. Um, yeah, there's a daily touch point. It's fun. I could, you know, people talk about it. Um, they have good operating efficiency uh, early on. Now, that's dropped. The operating margin is 7.6%. Right? So that's, uh, that is accurate. And I think like, that's the, but, but there's room. Because of that operating leverage, there's room to fight a price war, which, which is what Elon has started. And he knows that no one else is going to, everyone else has to create a loss leader for them to stay in the EV business while they learn. Um, there's a direct relationship um, with zero spend. Such an important lesson there. Zero spend. Um, the GigaPress makes production cheaper, but the supercharger network makes switching costs extremely high. The Tesla supercharger network, man, it, it, switching out of that, it, it's, it's so high that I think like the government's stepping in and helping to make it available to everybody. Um, I didn't know this. I looked this up. Uh, Tesla did actually receive a $465 million loan pre-IPO, which it fully repaid. I think it's the only car maker that ever repaid its loan or something like that. <laughs> um, let's take a look at Beyond Meat. So, so Tesla's not bad on that, on that list overall. Um, Beyond Meat uh, was the darling IPO in 2020-ish, 19 maybe, 18, something like that. June of 19, yeah, thank you. Um, and it was also one of the only pure play planetary health companies you could invest in at the time besides Tesla. So it does, is there ambitious goals with clear milestones? Um, yeah, there's, there's a stated goal of being better for the planet, but um, it's not precise in, in its messaging. They're not like, Beyond 3.0 burgers coming in June, right? That's. Uh, is there a 10x product that people can't live without? So it's red now. It was green, what, six years ago? It was green six years ago. I think there's an important lesson here, which is it was green for vegetarians that had Boca burgers. Frozen patty bro bo Boca burgers is what they were called. Um, that they are called. I think it's still around. And the substitute product, Beyond, was way better. But the market size for Boca burgers was like two hundred million dollars at the most. Hundred hundred million dollars, not one trillion. So by being precise, we can get to actual market sizes and understanding what the what the um, total sales potential could poten could be. Um, and so to Beyond Meat's credit, it's done an amazing job of expanding the TAM of, of uh, plant-based meats 
and burgers, uh, which is now $5 billion. That's a huge increase. Um, high gross margin potential. It actually had pretty good gross margins uh, when it IPO'd. Um, the S1 showed it was at 26%. It's now at negative 2%, which is killing the company. Um, why? Because it, didn't ha- it doesn't have a moat. And so everyone comes in with a plant-based burger, so spending on, on advertising has to increase massively. Production has to spin up. There's a lot of issues you have to solve, and so therefore gross margin goes way down. Um, is there a daily touch point? Or is there a fast cash flow? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a daily habit, buying a burger, eating a burger. It's a, it's a daily thing for, for many, many Americans. Um, the operating leverage and operating efficiency for the reasons that I just talked about is now a staggering negative 82% operating margin. That's, that's tough. It's, a, it's tough. Yeah. Um, I'm getting the, we, we should move on. It's 520. Ah, I said I'd be done at 520. Okay. Um, there's a moat um, built into it. There is a weak moat. Um, and that's been the biggest issue, I think, with Beyond Meat. So getting to the end of this uh, presentation, these are 10 principles. Or these traits can be used as principles to design enduring businesses. And it doesn't mean that you have to have all of them maxed. Right? That's the wrong takeaway. Um, there's a shape to these. To, to the, if you think of it as a graphic equalizer, what's the shape at different time points in a company's career arc? Questions later. Um, and one thing to take away, right? 10x products win. If you, can, if you could do one thing, if you just walk out and remember one thing, 10x product, be unique, differentiated, and win on one dimension that you could own. And so for me, you know, what gets me excited is actually this idea that using these, you know, these common traits, using all those technologies I talked about um, and, and shared, this incredible diversity of innovation that's happening right now can truly create a utopian idea of what a future is, which is better products that don't take from our future. So um, Tom's suggestion, uh, (laughs) here's some future work that we can do to think about how to push on some of these ideas. Is there a quarterback ranking, you know, like where you could just boil this down into a score uh, for a company? Um, Is there a universal law or metric that that can explain um, how climate tech adoption curves are happening? these KPIs, can we make them quantitative? Um, what are the relative weights? And what are new models for financing? I think that's an important one. There's different ways of getting to market and not all of them require, need venture capital or should have venture capital. Not all, all of them can create venture returns, but they're companies that need to exist. So thank you for listening. Um, I really appreciate it. I wanna say a special appreciation to Naveen Chala from Mayfield. Poe Bronson from IndieBio and Jocelyn Kinsey from DFJ Growth, who all uh, helped me um, revise and refine this uh, presentation for you all today. So thank you very much. Thank you. We've got time for just a few uh, quick questions here. Uh, students first, and student questions. Uh, actually, I figured out what your volume three is going to be. It's going to be the screenplay for Avatar 3. What do you think? Sounds good. <laughs> thank you, guys. Questions, let's go over there. Paris. Um, good. You're good. Okay, um, You're good. Yes. Paris, thank you so much for coming and speaking. This was very interesting and engaging. And I think it's a really interesting lens to look at venture capitalism through climate change. And I guess I wanted to ask, what was kind of the background, be it through education or intern experience or industry work, that kind of led you to this niche area? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, So I studied um, molecular cell biology and genetic, with an emphasis in genetic engineering at UC Santa Barbara. 
Um, I then went into finance, <laughs> as one does, um, as an options market maker uh, on the Pecos Exchange. And from there, I learned that uh, making money without creating value um, wasn't something I wanted to do. So I went to figure out what it is that would be something that I can do to create value. And that's how I found design. And really, for 10 years at IDEO, what I did was building businesses through product. And I was constantly looking for the constraints that lead to great products and great businesses because of that. And that led me to understand that the, you know, the problems of climate lead to great constraints and ones that we haven't considered. And when we consider those constraints, we can build better businesses. And that's what led to this talk. Arvin, great talk. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. And I wanted to get your take on things from your top 10. If you could just flip through real quickly and tell yeah. me which ones you think are non negotiable. As you said, we can't have all of them, but yeah. you know, which, which two or three do you think uh, there any you really have to have? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you for asking that. Let me see if I can find it. Um, no. Let's see. Actually, I should have had a summary slide. There you, yeah, they're, the, they're kind of like versions of them. Um, the 10x product is really the non-negotiable because unless you can do that, you don't have a path to change. That, that is the path to change. And so, uh, you know, it's iterating on that until you find what, it, what is the, the 10x for And it, it doesn't matter if it's a smaller market. If it's a, that, that's a natural thing when you're finding real 10x products, your market size naturally gets smaller because there's fewer people that are willing to pay even more. A good question to always ask yourself, and I ask this of startups often is, when I meet them is, what would it take for, for a customer to pay double what your, offer, what your price is today? Is there a customer that would pay double? Because that's true, then now you found your actual price, right? So I would say that's the number one thing, non-negotiable. Um, and then, because and everything flows from there. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. So you mentioned the 10X is kind of like the non-negotiable. Yeah. And you said beyond meat is kind of like not differentiable anymore because of these other Correct. Uh, meat companies. But why is Tesla still differentiable compared with other electric car companies? They all are quick and they all got these fancy screens. That's right, that's a great question. Um, they have two things that are, that are really going for it. Well, one, they could stay in business um, because they make money from selling cars. <laughs> so don't underestimate the fact that making money is important in the long run. Um, two, and that's because, of the, like I mentioned, the gigapress and innovating in the assembly line and taking out SG&A costs like advertising and all of this overhead, distributing directly through apps. There's a lot of things they're doing from a business perspective that allows them to make more money than others. Then, and the most important one, I think, is the switching cost of, of the supercharger network. That leaving the supercharger network is really hard once you're used to it. Um, and so I think that's what is cre creating a differentiated product. There are, the rest of those features, you're right. Everyone's like, oh man, people really want an electric car because of those features. So they, cop they, they go after those features, but they realize that that's not the com long-term competitive advantage of Tesla. Great. I think we're just about out of time. So, Arvin, thanks again for uh, okay. a truly inspiring talk. Well, thank you, guys. Hope you liked it. I'd love some feedback. If you